<laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time of conversation, and to learn about the goodness you have to us, and the truth about morality. Let us always live lives according to your will. We may follow you always, now and forever. Do all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we've been looking at John Paul II's Veritatis Splendor. He's examining what morality is, morality means, what truth is. And the last time we looked at the connection between the moral law and truth, that a, a morality without truth, a freedom without truth, is not free. So we have to have a freedom that is bound up on truth. We have to have a conscious bound up on truth. So if you simply try to have a freedom without truth, a freedom that simply is about me achieving my goal or self-actualizing myself or whatever other words people use these days, Freedom without truth ends up in slavery. And in the end, the truth we're looking for is not the idea of your truth or my truth, but an objective reality outside of ourselves. In the end, it's about God. In the end, it means we have to follow God himself, who is the creator of all things, the source of all things, and the one who gives all things their meaning. First of all, me, myself, I mean. Um, so that, that when, I, when I exercise freedom, when I exercise myself, my own free will, I do so in such a way that leads me back toward God, and according to his law, his truth. Any questions on that before we go on? I think everyone was here. So, in this next section, on Article 35, the Pope wants to examine the relationship between freedom and law. Because we do live in a world that does not like law very much. The Western world now excuse, more and more sees law as a hindrance to freedom and a hindrance to being where they want to be. Antinomian is the fancy word for that, against the law. So, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Article 35. In the book of Genesis, we read, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil shall not, shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall die. With this imagery, Revelation, meaning scripture, not the book of Revelation, God revealing himself to us. But the imagery of Revelation teaches us that the power to decide what is good and evil does not belong to man, but to God alone. The man is certainly free in as much as he can understand and accept God's commands. And he possesses an extremely far-reaching freedom. So he can eat of every tree in the garden. But his freedom is not unlimited. It must halt for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For it is called to accept the moral law given by God. In fact, human freedom finds authentic fulfillment precisely in the acceptance of that law. God who alone is good does perfectly what is good for man. And by virtue of his very love opposes this good to man in the commandments. 
a lot of here. A lot of really big ideas that are really important. The first idea is that freedom has limits. Because freedom is for something. Freedom of those because freedom is about something. Every good thing that we have, every good thing that we have has limits because it's meant, it's meant for a particular way. I can use the good things I have badly. Let's take the example of food. I don't know. Otherwise, use an example. Maybe I'm hungry at this time of day. Who knows? <laughs> food's a good thing. But I can use food badly. I can use food badly in a number of different ways. I am certainly free to eat. I'm certainly free to, to make what I want. But I can't use what I want to eat and say, I'm hungry to eat oranges. So I'm going to take all your oranges away. Let's steal your oranges. I can't eat to the extent where I become make myself sick. And I can't say I'm so free to eat, I'm not going to eat at all. I can't eat too much, can't eat too little, I can't take what is yours to feed myself. Uh, but, but beyond that, there is certainly free to eat whatever kind of food I want, when I want it, um, as long as it follows limits. And the reason why it has these limits is because freedom, any other thing that we have, is to lead me to what is good. If my freedom is leading me to what's bad, harmful to myself, harmful to those around me, hurtful to, to, to other people, it stops being freedom. It's not being used for what it's supposed to do. Just, that, just what, like when food is being used for what harms me or harms those around me, it's not, it's not doing as it's supposed to do, it becomes a bad thing, it becomes sinful. Or, you know, the old saying, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Guns aren't a bad thing, but they can be used badly. You know, it's like I can, I can, same thing with my hammer. Not a bad thing, but I can use it very badly. That's my argument on Twitter when they say guns don't kill people, people kill people. I mean, they don't kill people with pencils, sharpened pencils, knives, machetes. What do they use? What instrument do they use to kill them? AR-15s. Stop rifles. So don't say guns don't kill people. I mean, I'm not. Because I'm a gun owner, but I have an AR-15. I have a 223 rifle. It's like an AR-15 rifle, but not style like an AR-15 rifle. Mm -hmm. That's... That they're made for killing big elk and bears, but I gave that away because I don't have an elk and bear here to kill. <laughs> All right. I didn't get them on. So, we're called then to accept what's good, what's good. Ultimately, what's good for me is going to bring me back to God. Well, I'm made for God. And who God is and what God asks of me is not up to me. I don't get to change either myself or that asks for me. The law, so there, there is therefore a law from God, which is a guide to my freedom. Um, I'll talk about this in a minute in the next, par in the next paragraph, even though it's still the first paragraph. No, John Paul II's paragraphs often have six or eight paragraphs in them. <laughs> what can you do? She likes Paul. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I remember there was one time I was, was trying to translate a sentence from an old uh, manuscript. No, I was reading it. It was, it was already translated for me. Now, they also read one, one sentence. I'll try to parse it down. Literally, the sentence says it was a whole half a page long. And it was like, that's not a sentence. <laughs> but yes, it was. It was all these long commas. And then, you know, it's like, <laughs> yes, one period, but like eight semicolons and like 12 commas. It's like, get your reading in and what is it trying to read that? Here we go again. Okay. 
<laughs> so paragraph two of paragraph 35. <laughs> God's law does not reduce, much less to do away with human freedom, rather protects most that freedom. In contrast, however, some present-day cultural tendencies have given rise to several currents of thought of ethics, which center upon an alleged conflict between freedom and law, an anti nomadism <laughs> These doctrines would grant individuals or social groups the right to determine what's good or evil. Human freedom would thus be able to create values and would enjoy a primacy over truth to the point where truth itself would be considered a creation of freedom. Freedom would thus claim, claim moral autonomy, which would actually amount to an absolute sovereignty. We live in a culture and world that very often tries to claim, even though we find people of great intellectual prowess, or who look like they are anyway, a great in their name, will say these two things are opposite realities. Freedom and law work together, but they fight against each other, and, and if there's law, we're not free. And the only laws we can accept are those that we agree to, and, and laws that we, that we vote upon, the laws that we make, and therefore that'll make us free. A couple problems with this. As creatures, we are limited. None of us in this room is infinite, as, except for the invisible. But no creature, but the limit. no creature is infinite. We have limits, our intellect, we have limits, our imagination, our memory, our mind, our time and space, all kinds of things. And because we're limited creatures, we cannot function without limits. In fact, limits are necessary for us. Because we're limited. A couple of examples. In order to hear well, if there is too much noise, can you hear? You go dead. If there's too little noise, can you hear? No, you can't hear. You're deaf. Too much light, can you see? No. Too little light, can you see? No. Too much of anything, we can't function. Too little of anything, we can't function. We have limits. We keep your things in those limits. What's our senses function? What's our mind function? Our data function? Even when we reason, we reason by breaking down the chunks. There, there is a true reason why a couple of us have words on a page broken up into sections. You know that not that a couple thousand years ago when paper was a lot more expensive, there were no spaces between words or things down. You back and look at some of the old engineering manuscripts, there's no words spaces. You, you can sort of figure it out, but it's a lot harder. There's a reason why, why reading was a very uh, uh, rare skill. Most well, people, people just would just, you know, just tell me, you read it, you, you're, you're the scholar. Because there were, there were punctuation wasn't invented. And it was for the sake of saving all, all the paper and the ink, and then it was, it was why it was rare. When a scientist begins to discover something new, what do we start with? What can it do? What can it not do? How big is it? What colors are We try to find the limits. The word to define comes from two Latin words, de fine, of the limits. You know, they think of the word finish, it's the end. What are the limits of this thing? How do you define it? So the limits. When it comes to moral choice, when it comes to knowing what's good, what's bad, there's so many things out there which can seem good to us, or good to us in this context, or good to us in this way, that being unlimited, we can't function that way. So what laws do, is law gives us limits, let us function in our choices. If it's a true law, then 
I think John's going to talk about that later on. What laws do is they say, this is what's good. For it to be a true law, they have to point back to God's law. A law that goes against God's law or distracts from God's law uh, is not a literal law. Uh, because human beings don't have the rights to decide how it's supposed to go back. Um, and so a law that's against God's law is not a real law. Um, but with law, the purpose of law is to give us a direction in how to exercise our moral choices. And so any law, we're talking about the Ten Commandments, we're talking about the speed limits. They're meant to help us function our choices for the sake of leading us to what's good, ultimately to God. Right? The function of the speed limit is to make sure people are safe. So we can function well in a bunch of moving vehicles and all from different desires and intentions and to focus. The function of Ten Commandments is to is help us love well to walk with God and all the dog. They're all meant to lead us when we know how to exercise our freedom well. <clears throat> that my choice and my freedom can lead me not away from God, but back toward God. God is a limit that frees me. So law if it's a good law, unfortunately, you also very bad laws are laws that are against God's will. So when I say law, I mean true laws. Law makes me free. Because it directs and guides my freedom toward the world. Stop doing that, stop doing that. And this question of a true law or a false law actually will use the pagans, Roman pagans in this. Uh, the, the famous Latin lawyer Cicero uh, said that a law that leads someone to do bad things or directs someone to do bad things is not a true law, it should be ignored. Um, but. Some girl, some commentator on TV. I can't remember what network, right? But she got, she was speaking about Christian nationals and how nasty we poor what now nasty because we honestly believed. I mean, she's had such a state of the voice that she was in that we honestly believe that we get our freedoms not from the government. But from God. I mean, I mean, it was, that was it was just dripping. It was like, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> and so, what they're saying is the government can, yeah. can, can the government can give you freedom. Guess who can take it away? <laughs> yeah. The government gives rights. They can also take away the rights. Um, mm -hmm. If the government is not the source of rights, the government can't take them away or give them. Um, and that's actually, it's in, a, in our constitution, actually, in the founding document of our country. We have an element of rights from the creator. <laughs> so. I haven't figured out how these people don't ever understand it. Well, yeah, but that's. We're taking all that away. The government becomes your God. Just. Yeah, no, and it leads to very scary realities. Um, and the point we know this, right, because if you don't know these things, people can sound very persuasive. When they say, oh, well, you know, you don't want to lose your freedoms, do you? Or you don't want to, you don't want the, the people out there telling you what to do, do you? Or you don't want to be controlled by A or B, you know? You don't want to be, you don't want to be a non-scientific group, do you? And they can sound very persuasive. My dad told me he was a Christian nationalist. My dad's 91. At 90, he told me this. And I was going over watching the U.S. Supreme Court down to the federal prisoners taking away the rights to appeal, appeal the cases. And he was a state trooper, so I figured he knew the Constitution and the laws. He said, I agree with that because everybody I arrested was guilty. So then I had to be Sodom and Gomorrah, saying he's a Christian nationalist, get down to one innocent one, do we kill him? Mm -hmm. And then I used the state courts in Illinois when DNA first came out. 15 seconds on death row said they were in, innocent. So the governor himself paid for the DNA. 10 seconds on death row were innocent of crimes. And they were able to execute 10 of them. And that's a comment that I don't even care about people. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so our freedoms don't come from the government. The government has the responsibility to oversee and to make sure that, that, that they are preserved. Yeah. But the government has no right to either give or to take away. Um, the government is for the people and from the people, not the other way around. Um, and this is important that we know this and articulate this and understand this, not just for our state's rights, but also as Catholics living a life and following Christ first. Um, these, these are important ideas. Um, so I come to find this in prison, I pray for college, that in the end he doesn't believe, I send it to dad. <laughs> I'm sure he likes that. <laughs> well, I just want you to know everybody sitting in prison are not guilty. Mm -hmm. And you really have to know how to, if you're sitting on the jury, how to figure that out. Do you think yeah. their chance of uh, redemption, too? I mean, they, they, are, they, they, they are guilty, and you execute them before they've had a chance to make their peace. Yeah. That's a whole, death penalty is a whole different question. We get into it, but, but yeah, it's a just different question. Um, that there are times it's necessary, but yeah. not often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certainly shouldn't be our go-to, absolutely. Um, number 36. This modern concern for the claims of autonomy, that I don't have anyone else guiding me, directing me, that my own freedom tells me what, what to do, what's good and bad, has not felt exercise and influence also in the sphere of Catholic moral theology. So there are Catholic moral theologians who are confused by this line. While Catholic moral theology has certainly never attempted to set the human freedom against the divine law, or to question the existence of an ultimate religious foundation of moral norms, it has nonetheless been led to undertake a profound rethinking about the role of reason in the faith, identifying moral norms, the reference to specific interworldly kinds of behavior involving oneself, others, and the material world. In other words, the is saying, the kind of moral theologians, most, most of them are going to say, God is not the reason we exist. No one's going to say that. It's very, very clear that they're telling heresy. No one's going to say, um, you know, that in the end, God is the foundation for our laws. I mean, no Catholic is going to say that because it's very clear not being Catholic. But what they'll say is there are things a lot more insidious and a lot more subtle. Basically, what John Paul II was saying. They're saying, yeah, you're not going to say it. God is not important to be either Catholic. Maybe not as they would, but <laughs> in his day, they weren't going to say that, at least as a moral theologian. But they will say some other things. It must be acknowledged that underlying this work, this rethinking of the role of reason in the faith, to understand what these principles of morality are, there are certain positive concerns. There are good things here. There are reasons that they people confused about this, which to a great extent belong to the best tradition of Catholic thought. One of the things John Paul II is trying to do is he's not writing a list of complaints. He's not sitting here saying, here's what everyone else is wrong, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, that's all he's doing. He wants to say, let's pull this out and say, what's, what's good? Let's, let's be very fair and find out the best, assume the best, put out what's good, and then take down what's bad. He's being very, very fair, more than fair. In response to the encouragement of the Second Vatican Council, there has been a desire to foster dialogue with modern culture. Emphasizing the rational, thus universally understandable, communicable character of moral norms belongs to the sphere of moral, natural, natural moral law. There's been an attempt to reaffirm the interior character of the ethical requirements, driving from that law. Requirements that, which create obligation for the will only because some obligation was previously acknowledged by human reason and concretely by personal conscience. What he's saying here is, he says, one, one of the good things that you'll see is that there is a desire to talk to people in a modern culture in a way that they understand them. There's, and there is, that's a good thing. And there's a good desire to be able to say, I want to be able to show that reason and human conscience can point to some of these moral laws, give it to us in the scriptures. So that I can be, I'm able to say, Abortion's bad, not just because Jesus said so, but of course he certainly did. 
But also, I can show why that is, well, I, think, I know that from human reason, from my conscience. I can be able to say that marriage is one man and woman, not just because the Bible says so, so it's good to know that too, but I can show that from reason, from nature, and from scientific principles. And it's good to be able to do that. It's helpful. It's helpful to be able to talk to people of all kinds, of all cultures, of all backgrounds. Not simply to say, well, the Bible says this, or the church document says this, and therefore you must believe it. If we're trying to talk to somebody who's not Catholic or who's, who's an atheist, it's helpful to be able to say, well, okay, for right now, let's we'll set aside what the scripture says. Let's look at what reason says. Let's look at what the science says. Look at what biology says. Look at other scientific principles. And that's, that's not... That's a good thing to be able to do, to articulate and talk to anybody from any background or culture. So John Paul II is saying that is a good desire and a good attempt. However, some people, however, disregarding the dependence of human reason on divine wisdom, and the need given the present state of human nature, fallen nature, for divine revelation as an effective means for knowing moral truths, even those of the natural order, so what our body is for, what nature is for, have actually posited the complete sovereignty of reason the main and moral norms throughout our ordering of life in this world. So they've gone from simply saying, I can talk about these same things in a variety of different ways, to saying my reason is what's first. And I can understand what is right and wrong, first of all, primarily from my reason. And they ignore the fact that we are idiots sometimes because of original sin. They ignore the fact that God's the creator, and so God's law comes first, not what I think, what I can understand. Because it's true that my reason, if it's ordered rightly and guided correctly, can reach these things. I can also can make really dumb mistakes and can really, really false things and really be very harmful. Such norms would constitute the boundaries of merely human reality. They would be the expressions of a law which man in an autonomous manner laid down for himself exclusively in a human reason as its source. So they're saying, according to this theory, well, yes, there may be divine laws of, of worship God and things like that, but right, wrong, good, and bad, how you treat people, that can be spread up by a reason, a reason is what the source is of these moral truths and moral principles. In no way could God be considered the author of this law, except in the small sense that human reason exercises its autonomy in setting down laws of virtue of mortal, total mandate given with a man by God. These trends of our led to the denial in opposition to sacred scripture and through his constant teaching of the fact that natural moral law has God this all thing. And a man, by the use of his reason, participates in the eternal law, which is not for him to establish. So where is the problem with some of these thoughts? Because it's subverting the order of what law is for. When I reason, when I use the around, I'm, I'm grasping for understanding something that God has made. Yes, God made me free, but my freedom is direct me back toward God and live in a world that's created, but created by God for the sake of bringing the world back to God. In other words, God is for the source, the origin, and the goal. And if I cut that out of the middle, cut that out of the end, and say simply God said to man, be free, and we agree to say, okay, here's, here's some good things, leads me back to myself, and therefore it destroys me then from going back to God and the truth. And so what John II is reminding us is these two terms, the eternal law, That my reason is a share in that. My reason only works when I am God's eternal law. 
Do you remember what eternal was? Okay. So eternal, who is eternal? God. 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 Is there anything else besides God who is eternal? No. Only God is eternal. And so the eternal law is God's care and providence. This is God's providential care and ordering of the world. And because when God creates, before God created, what existed besides God? Nothing. It's God. Right. Good. Good. You got that one right. Good. When you and I create, you make something. You always have something you're pirating off of. You're pirating off of something we've seen, something we saw, something we saw in a dream. God doesn't create that way. What is God's pattern for everything he makes? Himself. God's pattern of creation is himself. So everything shared in some way in who he is in his own goodness. Everything is good because God is good. Everything exists because God exists. Everything is real because God is most real. The eternal law is actually God. God's own nature, God's own being, God's own reality. It does not change, it cannot change because God is not. My reason and, the, and my natural moral law cannot be arbitrary or change in time and season or in place. And so when I reason toward what's good or bad, it's a sharing in and a finding what God is telling me, how God's guiding me toward himself. Or it's a false reason. It's a false law. This doesn't come from me. This doesn't come from me. Where I'm going doesn't come from me. It all comes from God. It's back to God. And then there's only one appropriate way to do it. If I try to cut out this, and say my reason leads me toward the good, well, what's that mean? But whatever I want, or whatever we agree to, or whatever we vote on, or it's back to, to my self-actualization, well, what's that mean? What do you guys, what are you self-actualizing? Well, whatever I feel like. So then you're, then you're, your ultimate good is your feelings. Constantly Which constantly changes. We have to be tied back to recognizing as a creature of God, my good is to be like God. I was made to be like God, to live with God, to walk with God, to become his son or his daughter. And so, my, yes, my reason can, can come up with a whole bunch of, 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 can explain the moral law, can show why murder is bad, why adultery is bad, why abortion is bad, but you can prove it by reason. Law is reasonable. But if I don't have my guidelines, God's own life, I get very confused. It would be like a doctor who never saw a healthy person trying to figure out how to cure somebody. You don't know what, how many legs people have, you don't know what health is. Yeah, you can, I, I can know what well, this isn't good for you, but how do I know what is good for you? My, my model in the end is my Heavenly Father. My goal to Heavenly Father, what's healthy for me, what's good for me, is to become like God, to walk with God, and to live as God lives. And so my reason has to be tied back to the moral law, the eternal law, and it is a sharing in what God tells me, and what God leads me, and, and um, it is putting, it is using the gifts God gives me to express in the human language the truths of the divine. That makes sense? And so when people that cut this out focus simply on me and my reason, you end up with really weird things. You end up with really weird stuff. And so looking at reason is good, but you have to connect it back to the eternal law. In their desire, however, to keep the moral life in the Christian context, Certain moral theologians have made a distinction against Catholic dogma between ethical order, which would be of human of order, origin, and a value to this world alone, and an order of salvation, for which only certain intentions and pure attitudes regarding God and neighbor are significant. This has then led to an actual denial that there exists in divine relation a specific and determined moral content 
universally valid and permanent, no matter what culture, time, or place you're in. The word of God would then be limited to proposing an exhortation, a generic paranesis, which the autonomous reason alone would then have to the task completing with the normative directives, which are truly objective, to so adapt to the concrete of the situation. Naturally, an autonomy conceived in this way also involves the denial of specific doctrinal competence on the part of the church or magisterium, with regard to moral norms in particular, to the so-called human good. Such norms not be a part of the proper concept of revelation, they are themselves relevant for salvation. In other words, so some people would try to say, well, I don't, I don't really completely separate this. You better dumb it down a little bit for me. <laughs> This is John Paul II. Is yeah. <laughs> he a kind of lawyer too? He was a genius. He, he was, and he probably, he probably felt a genius. You, know, you read him and you go like, huh? And your dictionary and your thesaurus and everything else. He spoke like eight languages and, uh -huh. you know. I just spoke like, what parents. Um, I can't give you the goodness on top of my head, but I'll look it up for you. Um, for, a good, for a better definition, I could provide just... I did, I did. So a better definition I can provide on top of my head is an advice or a counsel. So the next time you, you say, uh, you just, you just talk to me, say, Father, let's have a good old paranesis. <laughs> Leave a paranesis from you, Father. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of the joke about, uh, I'll tell you later, I'm not. It's irrelevant, there it is. <laughs> so what this theory is saying, and it's trying to say, okay, yes, we're Catholics, you know, we're Christian context, but it's the same, there's two different things to look at. There is the ethical order, there's ethics, and there is salvation. And the idea is what the Bible will tell you more laws for salvation. You want to be saved, do these things. But when it comes to ethics, right and wrong, good and bad, that's all human. So that the, the, the Bible will be kind of general ideas, do good, marry well, what marriage is, what it looks like, what love is, what that looks like, that will figure out our own, that comes from us. So they're trying to say, well, there's some stuff the Bible will tell us, and, but that's only about salvation. It's not directly about going to heaven, and again, again this can sound very good and give an excuse to do what you want. <laughs> there's a couple problems with this, many problems with this. Um, and the thing is, what it does is it takes out salvation from other real life. What it says is that my religion, my faith, is not part of my day-to-day -day life, it's a special project I do on the weekends. And so yes, so this theory says, okay, yeah, there are certain things you have to be saved, but the ordinary human life you live, that's up to you. That's up to human reason, that's up to us to figure out how wrong. Well then what does my daily life have to do with salvation? It doesn't. Which I don't. I'd have to go back and read these, these particular theologians individually, like some Paul II and stuff, because I don't see how you can read the scripture and think that. I don't see how you can look at it and, and, and say, how can you claim that certain parts of your life are over to God, or are relevant to being saved, or are relevant to the whole point of scripture is that. God the command to walk with us through it for years to say every part of your life is open to God. Not just your weekends, not just this one hour of prayer. And what this theory is doing is separating parts of my life and saying, well, this part of my life is relevant to being saved. This part of my life, eh, we can figure that out on our own. We can change depending on the cultural context, you know, and what that looks like and what morality is. And God is kind of gives general indications, but not any real. But I don't see how you can read the scripture and think that. <laughs> so, moral theologians, 
referencing here because I said certain all theologians. So to save myself paper, separate the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, that's a path of salvation. You just said that. So I have to cut myself the play cards. Because I say that's not my favorite. Did you open the checks? I just put it. <laughs> Let me see if you have any of that here. And then I can move to the end. I can just be putting out the top of his editorial. Sure. Could you go down to the very back, back? So he's quoting there, number 65. Oh, okay. <laughs>
No, they have not. They promised they me no. I promise you. You never bring Texas law because I have right. one lady. I have right. One lady came to baby in your shit go out of state to get an abortion. That's not true. It is not true. There's a lot of stuff that are they're turning around and saying things to scare people. To it is not true. They it is not true. They will do the doctors that don't do the DNCs now. And yes, I'm they will. If, if the woman has suffered, I'm a medical person. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That I dealt with this kind of stuff. It's, it's not true. That's it's not true. true. Not it is not true. They are doing those things. Those, and so whatever you're reading is not, is not telling the truth. Um, those things are a different question in the way. And to lump those together is dishonest. Well, I'm just saying. That's what they do there. I don't know about it, but I'm just saying. A lot of the women down in Texas can't get a DNC right now because yes, yes, can. because the medical profession is afraid of them. Are you going to get a ten thousand dollar fine and jail? That's because the fact they're listening to the liberals, yeah, and the the liberals, liberals, and they're so, turning around and trying to scare them because they want all of the health issues. The more health issues they can come up with that they can cite, the more exceptions, the more their political stance is. They also push big time for the the over-the-counter pill and stuff as far as you know, mailing contraceptives. Where they do not tell these women, no, none of these women are being given um, ultrasounds. One in 50 pregnancies end up being an ectopic pregnancy. You give a woman with an ectopic pregnancy abortion pills, it will kill her probably. Because that tube will rupture and she will die. She'll be in 1947, way before our medical, medical procedures we have now, doctors were saying, I can show you the records, were saying there is no reason for a medical abortion. There is no reason to kill a child ever to save a life. Um, and so the problem is with these laws that we have now, is there's a great confusion of what's being said. And so there's a difference between removing a child who's dead, that's not, I mean, even though people give it the same name, and between killing a child for any reason. The difference between um, doing a procedure which might end up in someone's death, even the death of a child, and between directly killing a child for any reason. As soon as you directly make the death of the child your goal and your aim, you've entered, whatever we want to call it, as soon as you make the death of the child your goal and your aim, you do have committed murder. If you're doing a procedure that's necessary and a death results, but it's not your desire, your aim is an accident, that is moral and okay to do. And so part of the problem we have in these days, we live in a culture, in a world, where terms are confused, we're going by words, we're going by emotions, not going by morality. And we, want, we might be able to say that when it comes to God's law and it comes to the truth, every human being has rights from God from the day they're conceived to the day they die. And if there comes a time where, where in the course of a pregnancy, a woman is pregnant and she gets cancer, for example. You, could, you can't give her a procedure or a colleague pregnancy. You can't give her a procedure which directly kills the child. That's murder. You can do a procedure which might accidentally lead to the child's death. So chemotherapy, for example. A pregnant woman to save her life can have chemotherapy. Hope that the child's saved, but it might not always work out that way. But that's different than directly going in there to kill a child. And so whatever the language is being used, we want is to have a country, we need, to, we need to vote this way, have a country where every human life is valid and respected, whether from the moment of conception to the moment of death. Um, and right now we have a culture and a law which says that certain lives are valid than others. And we apply it in different ways. And we have a law that says right now that it is okay for, for and there are, people are trying to enshrine that in, in this state, people are trying to enshrine that your vet, your vet can kill a child at the request of a mother. Trying to put that into the, our constitution. constitution. Yes. Um, and so to speak on that is not a political thing, that's a moral thing. That's a moral right we have to speak about and explain, express, and uphold as Catholics. 
Um, and if, I'll, I'll say this, I don't think it's true, but if, if there are, are people who are, are going to the other extreme and saying that there is no medical procedure that, that the woman has to go into sepsis, um, if that's true, that, that it's also wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I would double check your facts and I would go look at those because I have read those things and I have seen where that, that's not true. But, but, but go ahead, but forget, right now, now I can prove that here in this. But, so, but, but I think we can both agree, if that were true, that would not be wrong. However, that would not make it an excuse to have abortion for other reasons. So there are different questions, different realities. And so we have to be able to separate those in our mind and say, okay, there's a difference in the moral reality between saying when a woman's going to set, when the baby has died, the child, that, that the, the corpse should be removed. That's a good thing. And between saying a child can be killed or murdered for any reason. That's always a bad thing. Those are different issues. Even if people, for various reasons, right, left, center, upside down, top side, are trying to connect them. Those are different questions, different issues, and we have to do our best to uphold both truths. Good? Good. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. <laughs> No one can fail to see that such an interpretation of the autonomy of human reason involves positions that are not compatible with Catholic teaching. In such a context, it is absolutely necessary to clarify in the light of the Word of God and the living tradition of the Church the fundamental notions of human freedom and the moral law, as well as the profound intimate relationship how freedom and law go together, how they uphold each other, why and both. Only thus will it be possible to respond to the rightful claim of the human reason in a way which accepts the valid elements present in certain currents of contemporary moral theology and not com compromising the Catholic her heritage of the moral teaching. The ideas are derived from the erroneous concept of autonomy. And so we want to be able to say at the whole at the same time human freedom, human rights, human, human co concepts of who we are as people. But that, if it's done right, it will never contradict the church's teaching of what's happening in heaven and what's right wrong. And so, as Catholics, we'll be able to look at both. We'll be able to say people have rights and freedom, and we uphold those things. At the same time, we we'll also have rights. And God is the one who directs our freedom, that has given us our freedom for certain reasons. In the end, it leads back to himself to bring us to heaven and to save us. So those things don't contradict, but people will at times make them look to contradict or apply one against the other. Both are good, both need to be upheld. Okay. okay, number 38, unless there are questions. I'm sure there are questions whether we want to ask them now and let them you know, think about it and ponder it a little more. Storm <laughs> Paul II, man, he's so good. So, what, what yeah. year is this written? 93. So, 20 years after the second of the same set? 30. 30. Then it's 65. Yeah. So, 30 years after. And so, there were. So, so, so I mean, so there were some great upheavals, right, in society at that point. You had the sexual revolution since that time, since the council between 1993. You had Roe v. Wade appearing, you had uh, contraception coming out, you had the question of humanity. Humanity 68. 68, okay. Um, and in the middle of that, when, uh, when Paul was sick of humanity, there was a rebellion in the moral theology. And you're talking inside the Vatican? Inside the Vatican. Worldwide. Worldwide, the Catholic Church. Um, and so in 68, Paul VI said contraception is a moral evil, and has always been a moral evil, and it can never be used. Um, there was a great number of moral theologians who stood up publicly and wrote letters uh, to the newspaper and said he's wrong, he's making a mistake, this is his own opinion, they ignore him. Um, in fact, in this diocese, 
I've been told that there were pre that there was people who were supposed to pass out letters. Um, they did the Pope's letter on this topic, and there are priests in our diocese who conspired. Apparently, someone found letters in our archives on how do we keep these out of the hands of the people, so we can tell them our own opinion and tell them what we want to tell them, and tell them the church has changed its mind on these things. When I was driving in today, I was listening to WTN, and they were having a discussion about humanity, and they were talking about the illicit, um, I can't remember the term they used, no, as far as you know, refusing to do you know, that it was, it was you know, illicit to go ahead and question it and stuff. Right. It's like, and, and they were talking about how you know, it was, you know, the friends that they were, Supposed to be talking about it as you know, if you want to talk about this at home and you want to speak at home, but don't be doing it. And it was like, no, there were a lot of priests that were out there speaking their minds and saying, oh, yeah, you don't have to worry about it or, or whatever. And it was like, well, and more than that, you had people preach from the pulpit and lying to people, right. you know, where people would say, I mean, I, I know a priest, an uh, older priest, who's a good man, a, a, a living saint, in my opinion. Um, but he was told in seminar. Uh, that's a number of years ago. So he's probably been in the 80s, 70s or 80s. So it's probably in the late 70s. But he was told in seminary, the church now teaches concept is okay. And so for the first 10 years of his priesthood, he just trusted what he was taught and was telling couples at home, well, this contraceptive and go do these things, and it's fine. So that's not a contraception. Uh, so the church says that. Men can have sex and women can't control the babies. Is what they're saying. No, that's not what's being said. <laughs> what's being said is, is that sex has a role and a reason. And that not role and the reason. Not at 70 years old, not at 60 years old. What was that? Not at 60 and 70 years old. If you're in death, you don't know what God's going to do. <laughs> When I went in for hysterectomy, the doctor told me I could have babies so I was 67 years old. I'm 67 now. Okay. I said, my heart's going to love you. Don't to women who can't have babies. So the, the thing is that, that sex has a reason and a purpose and a meaning. And that if that's you know, the context to any, in any way, then what you're doing is you're twisting the meaning of love and the meaning of the gift. Right. And so... Um, if a man or a woman, either way, is going to use each other simply for the purpose of pleasure, it no longer is an act of love, it's an act of grave sin. The thing is that human sexuality, human sexuality has a purpose from God. If I were to take my chalice and I were to go to my room and use it for coffee and donuts, that would be a problem, right? Yeah. Not because coffee donuts are bad, but because my child is meant for something particular, designed by God for something sacred and special. But I'm just saying, if they're going to fuss about women and birth control, by ever for men should be banned too. No, what 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 the, what you want to say I'm is that sex, sex, yes, it's for. The animals, it's for the ability for the sexual act taking place. Yeah. Contraception is important. Uh, yeah. and, and contraception is a, what it really is, is it is a bulimia, it is anorexia of the sexual act. What it's saying is I want the pleasure of the act without the love and the life that it brings. What you're doing at that point is you're putting a yeah, barrier. I get asked every day by men to have sex. I said, are you on Viagra? And they said, yes. At 67 years old, I have no desire for sex. But I got men. Well, outside of marriage, <laughs> but, I just got, development. but I just got men that take Viagra want sex now at 67, 70 years old. I'm saying, that should be a sin. <laughs> if the only reason they're doing it is to sleep around, that's a sin, yes. Yes. So yes. I'm saying, Viagra shall almost be banned too. Those guys. If they don't appreciate what, what, the, what the church says is that for a man or for a woman, you can use instruments that help and assist the sexual act, but don't replace it. If you replace the sexual act, it's wrong. If it assists or helps to take place in the context of marriage and context of love, and it's a good thing. Um, so contraception is not assisting or or helping. The union of husband and wife, 
It's putting a barrier between husband and wife and saying, I don't want children. It's saying, I don't want part of you and I'm refusing part of you. What's well, saying, I don't accept part, part of your femininity, part of your masculinity, and I don't want children with you. That's a different thing than saying, in the context of marriage, in the context of love. I'm not saying about marriage, I'm just saying for men in general, out, not married, yeah. they shouldn't have viable. They shouldn't have sex, period. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and that's always been a law of the church, absolutely. <laughs> I heard they give it to people in the uh, old folks' home, to the old guys, so they have a lot of dead at night. <laughs> this is recorded, guys. Come on. <laughs> I have to beep things out. A priest had gone to talk to a priest one time. Mm -hmm. And he had told, she had said, I want to have more kids, you know, and can. He get a vasectomy and the priest told him they could because you know they have four kids so they've done their part. And that is wrong. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I just I just couldn't believe <laughs> that he told her that. And this is why John Paul II is trying to put Prince's moral theology on. Why he's trying to say go back to God's laws and God's truths. Yeah. Because if all, if all we rely upon is my feelings or my emotions and what I think is good, and if all kinds of crazy territory, we're going to say, oh, well, you know, John and Susie are in love, and yeah, I know they're not married to each other, but they really love each other, and so, yeah, I know it's so, it's, maybe in their case, their adultery is okay. Or, you know, um, Fill in the blank. I mean, I have to, you know, even all from within examples, I have to try to give examples. The, the point is that every time we discuss morality, every time we talk about what's right and wrong, we have to begin with this recognition that my freedom, what's right and wrong, begins with following Christ. And so, therefore, there are going to be things that are going to tell me to do which I might like. It's going to tell me that marriage is sacred. He's going to tell me that the union of husband and wife is a sacred thing only for marriage. He's going to tell me that I can't steal, I can't lie, I can't be people up on that man. He's going to tell me that um, I can't kill anybody. I keep, he's going to tell me that I can't gossip. And these things are hard. I mean, darn it. <laughs> he's going to tell me I can't overreach. He's going to tell me that, but I follow Christ. And when I follow Christ, this is not only good for me personally, it's good for my relationships with those around me, it's going to help me love the people I know, it's going to help me care for the people, my friends and family. Because any other way to live the world is, is destructive and harmful. And so every time that I have to look at these questions, and there are some difficult questions, and there are painful questions, and there are things that are very difficult and complicated, you know, where you do have a question where people are, are very emotional and very hurt and it becomes very sensitive and it's very easy for anyone to say oh well in your case make an exception but what you're saying in the end is well in your case you're going to follow Christ in your case you can ignore God in your case and that's not kind that's cruel it feels kind it's, it's an easy yes it's they'll have to like you for saying that but what you're doing is you're leading them away from God and leading them toward hell and so we want to be able to say that even when these questions are difficult or confusing and painful, my mind, my heart, my will follows what God says, what the scriptures say, what the church has always taught, and that no one can change that. I had this situation where this lady takes care, was taking care of another, mm -hmm. and she had kind of put out this question wasn't in the question, but it just said, shouldn't you, if you get to be 100 years old and you're sound in mind, shouldn't you be able to exit if nope. you choose? And see, and I said that, and I got piled on. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it. Yeah. Right. It's hard to and, get it with, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm and it kind of scared me because so many people yeah. thought I was wrong and that people should be able to kill themselves yeah. or you need to get rid of somebody. But 
It was kind of, pretty, it was pretty scary. And I told uh, Marnie, I wrote my family, with my brothers and sisters about this that happened. And my brother told me, you were being mean, and you need to keep your mouth shut and mind your own business. Oh, it's kind of a reaction. Yeah, I thought it was to somebody who's terminally ill. It does speed it up a little bit, but it eases. So, pilot of care. I'm yeah. worried about my mom yeah. and the okay. process, but <laughs> I wanted to be. Yeah. You know, not comfort. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so, so, again. She was you know, dying, definitely. So, let me start with this first and then I'll address that. So, the, the problem with saying I can kill myself when I get too sick or too old or. Just, and this case, there was nothing wrong with this. Well, but for any, but any, yeah. Okay. I mean, if, if you can, in the end, you're denying the Lordship, Lord, God is Lord of life and death. You're denying the meaning of suffering. You're denying the meaning of life and death. And for human beings, there's a meaning of, of these things. Become, that's what Christ himself died. Christ walks through death, and so all of these things are denying those things. If you're saying that the, I'm the one who decides my life, I'm the one who decides my death, I'm the one who decides, what you're saying is my life, my death has no meaning other than what I give it. Going back to that autonomy. <laughs> um, and so you can't deny these things, and if people do deny them, you need to be corrected. Yeah. And it's hard because people want to listen to it. Right. It was, it was, it was kind of scary, I yeah. thought. You know, you don't want to take care of it. Right, exactly. But then, you know, they're, they're saying things like, well, God doesn't want people to suffer. He's not, you know, he would be, you know, you know, he doesn't want people yeah. to suffer. Send his son to suffer. And there's a mean, there's a mean to suffering, yeah. See, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's no, it's scary. It, it, this is how a lot of people are. Yeah. And a lot of people are very confused about this, yeah. Your own family, um, your own children. Yep. There's all these topics of conscious yes. thought of it. And yep. all the innocuous thing you would think. I said, I wanted to go to the blank store while I was down there visiting. But it was Sunday by the time things roll around. I said, no, I'll wait because it's Sunday. And my son-in-law and a pile of people have to work. <laughs> well, this, this isn't a necessary. Um, no. But, you know. And if, you, if you'd said that when well, they have given every Monday off, no one would care. Yeah. People have to rest. And so a lot of places when I get Mondays off or Tuesdays off or Saturdays off, simply because it's not Sunday. Um, and, and you'll see that very, very clearly. Yeah. Okay, you know, Yeah. But it, it's taking more and more courage to, to be Catholic. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. hard to when you have family, they do, they do that. And apologetics, I think we brought that up a few yeah. times, would be helpful. But in some situations, you're just going to have to just. I don't know, I'm not the one to give advice, but you know, you just gotta walk the walk and, and, and pray that they And you have to remember when it comes to family. Yeah. <laughs> Families rarely listen to you, even if you're right. I think so many times where you know there's someone in your family, you know, in people's families where those are the exact same things that can be said brilliantly and wonderfully. And say, I, I'm a, here's my brother, here's my mom, here's my whatever. And that's enough to say it. I go, wow, I've never heard that before. It's incredible. <laughs> I never heard, where, no, no one's ever told me that before. It's like, well, your, your mom told you. You're, <laughs> I heard her tell you to you. You know. So that's family. But when it comes to uh, palliative care. So, yes, it is acceptable to give somebody comfort, uh, but there is a limit to that comfort. So you, you want to make certain that the comfort they're giving doesn't compromise their ability to reason to the extent that they're unable to, to receive the sacraments. You want to make certain the comfort they're given uh, does not kill them, um, but is an act of comfort. Um, and, the problem, and, and so you have to be careful with who you're trusting to give that, that palliative care and, and what the purpose of doing it is. Um, because if someone is so un is kept in a coma to the extent that they can't really confession, can't receive, can't receive communion, that's very harmful. If it simply is easing the pain, the suffering, um, and is letting them pass more comfortably, that's okay. But it should not kill them, and there are times that happens, and it should not prevent them from giving means their suffering or being able to enter into death prepared. Mm -hmm. If that, yeah, that okay. makes sense. 
Well, so, so, you know, there, there was what, she was basically comatose, I mean, in my aunt too, already. Yeah. And, and just kind of, but they still can feel or get, uh, when they have difficulty breathing, they get agitated. That's, that's mm -hmm. what that's for. And, and yeah. very gradual dosing, not to the point of, you know, now sometimes it's been like they, they have no one just like a pump. Yeah, and that's what they told moms, right? Yeah. And again, so, so if it doesn't cause, but is easing, that's okay. If it's causing, not okay. Um, and the same thing is, is, is true with when you're able to remove someone's machine or able to remove somebody's, you know, if it's not causing their death, that's fine. But if it's allowing their death, that, that is okay. Um, you can never directly kill somebody, but you can't let you can't let nature take its course. You can say, you know, they're at a point where I'm just going to let the body close down as it closes down. But that's different than saying I'm going to kill you. Yeah, good times. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> uh, any other questions before we close the prayer? Okay, let's close with a prayer and uh, move on from there. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this discussion. Help us to understand more fully and truly what your will is, and give us the courage to carry it out, no matter what it is. Be all that we say and, be, and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.